Today is Yom Yerushalayim. Fifty years ago, when the greatest miracles occurred, at the time everyone, Jew and Gentile, regarded it as a great miracle. The whole Muslim world also. And uh, it was surely sent by Hashem so that we should gain understanding when Harabait Beadenu was announced on that day, when previously all the Jews in the state of Israel were trembling and they knew that all the armies around wanted to destroy them. They joined together and their forces were so strong there was no chance. The synagogues were open day and night and few were afraid. And when it turned the other direction <coughs> it caught everyone in complete amazement. In fact, the more records that come out each year of what actually happened, the more amazing it was. And all the mass media were filled with fantastic series of miracles at every level. But after a time, it wore off. Then people began to think, which, as we've explained, is a great hazard for the people of Israel when Hashem sends a great blessing and we say, it is mine. And this is even expressed when Harabayat Beyadeinu is in our hands. Which brought uh, some people to think, oh, look what's happened. To the great people of Israel, the great army, and the great intelligence service, and the great diplomacy. And people forgot about all the miracles, many of them. And then the slogans changed. So maybe this is the most important lesson. And let's try to understand what is really the significance of Harabait Piyadeo. What does it mean? And this has close connection with counting the Omer. So we've explained in the previous shiurim that counting the Omer is the way in which the people of Israel originally prepared themselves when they were really on a low level, to the highest level, by working hard on their moral qualities and trying to come nearer and nearer to appreciate the truth of God in their lives as individuals and as a nation. And uh, to understand this deeply, first I'd like to conclude the exposition of Rabbi Tzadok HaKohen, which we started but did not quite finish. So I'd like to finish this first. We were speaking about the greatness of, which has become now the greatest festival, attended by the largest number of Jews from the world on one day, of Lag Honor. We explain that was when Moshe Rabbeinu died, we know what his date of his death was. In the seventh Adar, we don't make a celebration. And there was the greatest prophet ever. And we found the greatest probably the greatest saint ever. Most close to Hashem. And yet we don't make a Hilula. And you make a fast day. The Hebra Kadisha, the Mikasium. You can then the end with, a, with also a Suda. But basically it's a fast day. The same applies to the greatest teacher of Rabbi Shimbun Yochai, Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Shimbun Yochai himself says 
I'm just a small fraction of the great qualities of Rabbi Akiva. And for Rabbi Akiva's death, we don't celebrate it. Of course, you can say because he was massacred, tortured. While Shimon Echai, on the last day before he died, he gained the highest prophecies and the highest revelations through Elijah and through others, and produced uh, very deep sections of the Zohar on that day. So, we can't very well celebrate the torture through which Rabbi Akiva went. So we already explained that there's a chain of tradition going from Moshe Rabbeinu, Kippur Torah Misinai. He received not just the written Torah, but also the oral tradition, both as it was called the halachic level, the agadic level, and the esoteric level, which is like the prophet, almost the prophetic level. And that was sustained by the greatest saints and scholars in each generation, from Moshe Rabbeinu, as described in Pekavot, to Ragun and Asi after the destruction of both Beth and Mikdash, and carrying on Rabbi Kiva, and carrying on till today. Because they are the ones who, to Hashem, reveals deeper aspects of Torah. And it's well known that is the greatest fabulous of our generation, almost probably the greatest masters of Torah. They keep it a secret. They're not the ones who publicize it. So, for example, it's well known that Shalem Zalman, Uabach, was one of the greatest poskim, and also guides in Halakha of Am Yisrael, a previous generation. It was privileged to be close to him. People didn't know, and they found out afterwards, that in the middle of the night, he had, in, in, I think in one of the Machsanim, he had the stock of Tzifrei Kabbalah. It's well known also, Rabbi Yashiv, he didn't speak about it, he kept it uh, quiet, non-stop. He was able to give drashot, really close to the Zohar. But he was really the disciple of his grandfather, who was the greatest Kabbalist in recent times, according to the traditions of the Gaon of Vilna, and produced what's known as the Leshen. And in fact, in his room, he had one portrait up, that of his grandfather. So, we can understand Chimba Chai, we live in a generation where people are searching. So they're searching for Hashem, which is described in the Prophet. non Jews also search for Hashem. And that means there are many openings that they give the people who really search, search for Hashem, they find Him, Jews and non-Jews. They find Him through inner experiences, in many ways. I mean, if uh, some of them will find it only through near-death experience, like Abe Alexander described. That he's got his website, his book, Proof from Heaven, of the existence of God, with whom he has close connections, when his brain got damaged, he came out of it. He could, although previously himself, being a brain surgeon, he never believed all these reports, today there are millions of them, of a life after death. But now himself, he can't find no way to deny it. So we live in such an age. And therefore, we can understand why Lagba Omer is such a big attraction. So here I'll continue now, just for the last column, what Rabbi Tzadok says about Lagba Omer. 
He says that um, when we make fasts for people who have died, it's to remember what the great saints achieved in their lives, to remember it. And there were many of them, many of the great saints, who did enormous acts of loving kindness. It was brought to the highest level. Because we say through the three things, the Torah, Badag, Milchazim, one can merit to be a Ben Olam Abab. You reach the highest level. What is our Olam? It means the spiritual world. So, um, this then explains that you can reach it through Torah, and you should be a Choy. He achieved it through Torah. Dedicated to Torah under all circumstances, even the extent that he couldn't understand why people should engage in physical activity. And also, he was on such a level that he was really freed from the duty of Avodah. For Torah, Torah itself is Chayul Amaba. We explained that the, the date of Lag Bomer is the same date when the mom fell. In other words, someone who recognizes that all food is a gift that comes from Hashem, so it's heavenly bread, and a person can be sustained by this heavenly bread, which is really the spiritual bread. It's close to the type of bread which came out to Moshe Rabbeinu when he was three times 40 days and nights without any bread. So what sustained him? Heavenly bread. The spiritual power sustained him. Similar to 30 years where Shimon Yechua and his son were sustained by a miraculous fountain of water and the fruit of a carob tree which is not enough to keep a person alive, but it's enough for them. So <clears throat> this is also a type of living <clears throat> on an almost spiritual level. Still physical aspect, their body remain, but this explains the connection. <clears throat> so to come back to the subject of this being all part <coughs> of the period between Pesach and Shavuos, <coughs> which represents, as we explained already, <coughs> all human beings start on the physical level. <coughs> For which we require to eat something made from flour, some form of bread. <coughs> What form of bread represented the people of Israel when went off from Egypt? Barley bread, which is animal fodder, which means that we were like the animals, with intelligence, but still with no really uh, ability to use our power of thought, and the mind, and the deep intuitions as being the purpose of having a body. But we had to raise ourselves up step by step to reach our words, in which we were on such a high level we could hear the voice of God speaking to us, each person. That means we reached what we call today a prophetic level, a spiritual level. And then the offering which had brought in the temple 
in later times was human food, the two loaves. Now, this is a transition from the position of the people of Israel when we went out of Egypt <coughs> and wandered in the desert <coughs> to reach the level of hearing the Torah. The question is, <coughs> that episode, which you call Mamad HaSinai, where the Decalogue is given to the people on the condition that no one should ascend the mountain. There is a scripture in the 19th chapter which precedes the giving of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, of the preparation that's been made to reach holiness. Holiness means that one subjects every aspect of material life to link it up with an awareness of God, that He is the source of everything. So therefore they had to reach Kedusha, Kedash Temetahab, that is sanctify their bodies, or to keep them away from marital life. And they had to immerse themselves also in water and liquor. And then they had to prepare. And those three days of preparation, they were not permitted to go on the mountain. And then there came <coughs> the, the fire at the top of the mountain, and the smoke that surrounded, and the voice of the shofar. All these were supernatural events, making that event above, to some extent, above all space. It became a place on this earth which represented the way in which heaven can reach earth, the way in which the voice of God came out from the fire on top of the mountain. And the people, if they would go on the mountain, and even the cattle, were not allowed to go on the mountain. Although, during the Mount of Sinai, the mountain was fertile. But then afterwards, when it's finished, nothing left. There's nothing further in that desert. It's even difficult, clearly, to define which mountain it was. But some say, since it's the same mountain as the burning bush, so there were bushes on that mountain before Mount Sinai. What happened to all those bushes, which you don't find in the desert anymore? They've become fossilized. And therefore, this one mountain, but every little stone has on it a fossil image of bush, of a bush. And that's why it's generally identified as such. So the, the Christian made a monastery there. That's the Mount of Sinai. But it does not, not have holiness. What happened to the holiness? So here we have in Tehillim 68. It's a chapter which deals with the giving of the Torah. And the Hashem chose which mountain did she choose. In the Middle East did he choose. There are much bigger mountains and more important mountains than this little mountain in Sinai. So it says in Tehillim 68. So, if you've got Jews from Bible, you can follow it with me, which is the key to understanding what happened to the mountain. It's on page 758. This is to hit it. So it says here, describes it. That when you went out from Egypt in front of your people, the earth shook, the heavens dropped at the presence of God, even Sinai itself, the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain. The flock found a dwelling in it. You, O oh God, prepared that goodness for the poor. The Lord gives the word, great is the company of those who bear the tidings. The kings of armies flee, and she who dwells in the house divides the spoil. 
Then it said, further down, O mighty hill, the hill of Bashan, high peak hill, hill of Bashan, O high peak hill, at the mountain which God has desired for his abode, truly Hashem will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. Hashem is a mountain. See nine holiness. This phrase, it says that Hashem bomb, see nine bakodesh. Hashem is now amongst the people of Israel, and Sinai has entered into the holy place. You ascended high. You received gifts from men, from the rebellious lasses, that Hashem God might dwell there. I would say the key phrase is Hashem Bom Sina Bakodesh, which is elaborated especially in the commentary of the Ramban. He says it frequently, all through his commentary. What happened to Sinai? He says Sinai was put into the sanctuary. And he says, Hashem spoke to the Moshe Rabbeinu, and the Moshe, even the people of Israel heard it, from Sinai. But he kept on giving us other aspects of the Torah later. From where? From between the cherubs, which are on top of the golden ark. He kept on revealing his will to Moshe. So that the Torah continues. The Ramban says, Hashem's revelation was first given at Sinai. It continued all the way through the existence of the sanctuary the central part of it, the Holy of Holies, had a golden ark and golden cherubs which shone like fire to represent the way in which God's word came out from that fire to Moshe, then Moshe passed on to the people. And that continued as long as there was the sanctuary, which went from place to place, at seven different places, until it came to rest where? on the Temple Mount. We already explained how this link is also in Sfirat HaOmer. The previous year explained how the counting of the Omer is seven multiplied by itself seven times, always reaching a jubilee. The first jubilee is when the Torah was given, it's also called Yovel, what they experienced at the mountain was a jubilee. The 50th day was the first jubilee when the Torah was given. Even the Shofa is called, the Kola Shofa is described as a jubilee Shofa. So that was the first 50. If you multiply that 50 by 7, then you get a year, as we described it. You get a Shemitah. When you get the Shemitah, when you multiply it by seven, you get the Jubilee. And you have, as it were, in the Jubilee here, in the land. What was previously in the desert, a desert experience open to all mankind, and really intended for all mankind all over the world. But since mankind was not ready, so it was given to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people had to apply the Decalogue, what it represents in their land. So therefore the Jubilee in the desert was transformed and was even in certain ways spread further to have a Jubilee in the land. The land has to be dedicated to Hashem, all the land. And they have also, <coughs> the truth is, the Jubilee year in the land has in it all the elements which were on the mountain of Sinai. Also, because you've got to leave 
the land fallow, and also in the Jubilee year, everything goes back to its ultimate roots, you go back to the source, and you've got to give freedom, and the Shofar, which was in the kingdom of the Torah, is now the Shofar of Yom Kippur, which goes all through the land, the Jubilee year. So, in America, where the Puritans went back to the Hebrew of the Chumash, they produced the Liberty Bell, which goes back, on it is written, the verse, Mesh of the Chumash, that it is a jubilee, you should call freedom to the whole land. This really the whole world. That's how it was, Sinai. But when it was in the Yoga, in practice, it meant in the land of Israel. And which is the highest service? To which is this connected? It's connected to Yom Kippur. Why Yom Kippur? Because Yom Kippur was the day when Moshe came down with the second Luchot. First one to run. Second one. To teach us, you can always do Teshuvah. You can always give him a second chance. And also, every Jubilee, people Israel gave us a second chance. When we didn't keep this whole concept, so, because we didn't keep the Shemitah and the Yerim, so for the 70 years, where this was not kept, we had a banishment from the land of Israel. We only allowed back for the second terrible period after the end of the 70 years, which actually happened. And this therefore shows us how the impact of the giving of the Torah on Sinai became, as it were, a spiritual path which is now faced by the old Jewish people. And then, as, we, as I explained further, the seven, seven Jubilees make up, as we said, the uh, 245 years, which was the year when the Torah was given. So we get right back seven, multiply seven times, we get, go right back to the date when the Torah was given originally. So now we also understand something further. Since all these events have to do with the giving of the Torah at Sinai and the prohibition to go up the mountain, why was it prohibited to go up the mountain? Because they, they had to accept that the Torah comes from a supernatural power, above time and above space. Above time because the date of Shavuot is not mentioned directly. It just says seven times seven weeks. It's, it's, it's a combination of the seven, which represents nature, to reach the level of supernature, to reach the level that we must know that the Harabait is holy, the holy man, part of, the, part of the producing holiness. This brings us back to the important event that the Harabait was in our hands, and nevertheless, even those who were in charge were not to speak to the scholars, but nevertheless, they decided we're not making the Rabbis permissible for Jews to go on because it's forbidden by the Torah. Perhaps that wasn't the only reasoning. It also would have caused enormous provocations and still does until today. Therefore, today we're faced with this situation that the Harabite if it's Biadenu, we certainly have to see to it that the, the enemies shall not go and destroy any commemoration of the holiness of Jerusalem. On the contrary, we've got to demonstrate that it's holy and really people are not supposed to go up on the mountain. And when, when this whole discussion was raised a few hundred years ago, when the Sultan, as happens in Muslim ups and downs, was friendly towards the Jews. He said, as long as you leave the, our mosque at the top of the mountain, and you don't come there on the place of the temple itself, but if you want to do something on the mountain, you can do it. 
And uh, it happened also in the time of the Rambam. The Rambam himself writes in his time, his famous letter to Taman, <coughs> where Muslims were persecuted and killing Jews, he described him as evil, but he himself accepted the position of the Sultan to be his personal doctor in Cairo, but that was a Sultan in Egypt, they were friends of the Jews. They didn't mind it. The same happened also in <coughs> the child of Tzmiyash Kalisha, <coughs> who, who persuaded the Sultan that the Jews, if they want to, who doesn't mind, they will bring an offering on the Temple Mount. So he said, well, in certain circumstances, he put forward the opinion that maybe it is possible, but the basis was they were not provoking the, any of the Muslims. Just like in the, in the Ramel Samosa in Egypt, at that time they were friendly. But you never know, change it with them. Today, obviously, any provocation is, 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 creates, creates the, <coughs> the becoming wild. They become wild and it's, it's very dangerous. But apart from the danger, it's also certainly today against the Allah. But decided upon by, by all the chief rabbis, by Rav Kut and everyone else. So really, our way of appreciating Biadeinu is that we're able to pray near the bottom of the rabbi, we're able to see it, and uh, we look forward also to the time we're sad, we even have to tear our clothes the first time we see it, that it's in the hands of the enemies to a great extent. It's much more in the hands of enemies than any of us can really bear, because they destroy the the clear history of the connection of the Jewish people, and even then today, so the nation of the world, they, they, many of them are following falsifications of what, what is what's clearly enormous testimony that the connection of the Jewish people with the Temple Mount is enormous. But what we should pray for is what's written on the walls of the United Nations who also thereby recognized the prophecy of Isaiah and Micha, the ultimate nation of the world will come and say, let's go to the mountain, let's learn from the Jewish people, when there will be another Beit HaMikdash, and when they when also connected with it, war and jealousy will no longer rule mankind, neither individuals nor nations, and instead they will do, they will follow everything in the peaceful ways of the Torah, the Rechet HaChinoah, Yitz Hashem, we should all look forward to the age when human beings will get enough moral sense from the Torah, from what was revealed on Sinai. We should continue to the Beit HaMikdash, that we all experience the level of the future where one of the conditions is, Lo Yil Medu Ar Milchama, people no longer use their lives to learn warfare or battles for, for physical existence of individuals, of nations, will no longer rule the minds, activities of the human race, but instead they'll stop, they'll stop this stupid, destructive instincts within man and instead work together. The Avdor Shechem Echad said the Prophet to worship Hashem as with one shoulder, all mankind, then we'll see the fulfillment not of the UNESCO uh, declarations made by the United Nations, but rather what's written on the walls of the United Nations should become fulfilled in our days. And then the symbols of the State of Israel will take on a much deeper meaning. The blue and white flag goes back to the tzitzis. The tzitzis teach us we shouldn't go astray after materialistic instincts. Instead, we should dedicate our lives to holiness. And thereby it says, it will, will the the, we say, Vavinu Shalom, then the blue and white, the blue represents the heavenly dimension on top of the human dimension. So the heavenly dimension is, is when you look right to the source, you look beyond the horizon, and you recognize, it's described, 
that you, when you look at the tzitzis, when you look at the flag, you think of Hashem, or Yitem or Tov, and you learn to think of Hashem, to do away with just going after the physical, animalistic instinct, and instead you go after the instinct for purity and for high level morality. And those instincts will rule us as individuals, rule us as a nation, and rule mankind also as a way to change the nature of the human race to the highest level. That's the tzitzit. And the other symbol of the state is the menorah in the Beit Hamikdash, which is spreading the light of God, it's Hashem to the whole world. So we hope that will be fulfilled in our time on this Yom Yerushalayim.